So, <laughs> hi. Um, a week ago, my dream came true. I wrote a book. I published a book. It's the only thing I've ever really wanted in my life. Um, and so you're seeing the finished product. Um, but I wanted to be really honest about the journey that I've taken to get here because you see the final product, you see Instagram, but you don't know everything that went into making it happen. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, a lot of the things, the reasons why I was able to publish a book and get um, <laughs> a really beautiful Instagram following um, are things that are reasons that I thought um, were bad about myself. There were things that I didn't like about myself for a long time, or things that I actually thought hindered my success. Um, it was a collection of experiences that really didn't add up, beginning when I was, uh, when I was really young. Um, when I was a kid, I really didn't fit in anywhere. I've got to have some water for this. <laughs> Excuse me. Another moment to take it in. Thank you. Oh, gosh. I'm very excited. When I was a kid, I really didn't fit in anywhere. I'm an only child, and I felt um, a lot more comfortable with adults than kids. But adults don't really want to invite a seven-year-old to their dinner party. Um, it wasn't because I was smarter or more precocious than other kids. I just didn't know what they were talking about. I spent a lot of time with my mom, and I didn't really fit in with kids, but I didn't really fit in with adults. I felt like I was in between two worlds all the time. I felt that way through adolescence. I never felt like I fit in. And the beauty of not fitting in is that you're always watching people. People ask me where I get my ideas now. And the thing is, I just have ideas coming all the time because I developed that observational muscle. I'm always watching people. I'm always looking. And I think the disservice of fitting in everywhere is you don't get that. You don't get the opportunity to just watch. And because I developed that muscle when I was a kid, it's really served me in adulthood. I still have it, even though now I have friends. <laughs> so that was something I certainly thought was terrible about myself, but it really turned into a creative power. Um, then as I grew up, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Or rather, I wanted to do way too many things. Water break. Millennials have a lot of pressure on them to find that one thing that they really want to do, that one passion, thing that keeps them up at night. But I didn't really have that. I had a lot of things I was really into. I had like dancing and listening to music and um, Thai food. I had so many things I was really, really into. I liked writing. I liked drawing. wasn't very good at it. I liked playing the clarinet. Um, I liked like indie music, but nothing really felt like much of a passion. And because of that, I just had to follow my whims. I had to take a million different kinds of jobs. I had to study medieval history because I didn't really know what else to study. I, ha I was forced to experience so much of life. And because of that, I got to try a lot of different things. I got to experience not just different careers, but also dating and living in different cities. I didn't really know what I wanted, or I just wanted to experience the world. And because of that, I had all of these experiences under my belt. When you know exactly what you're doing at a young age, I dare say you miss out on a lot of young life experiences, which are really fun. The power that you cultivate through uncertainty is a wealth of life experience. Um, I am just now at 31 learning how to invest money. And I called the investment people today. I don't know if that's a bank. I don't even know what it is. I called like an 800 number. And I heard that you should invest in index funds. So I was like, hi, I want to invest in index funds. And they said, oh, well, looking at your information, it looks like um, maybe you should invest in admiral shares. 
And I was like, sure, I have no, you like, you could have told me anything. But the one thing I know about investment is that you have to diversify your portfolio, right? Is, is that correct? And <laughs> I feel like that's the key to life too. If you have your entire identity based on your Instagram followers or your career or your boyfriend or even your friend group, that's going to disappoint you at some point. Um, exactly a year ago, I was paralyzed with a autoimmune disease while I was um, traveling in Spain, paralyzed in my arms and legs. And everything that I identified with um, was taken from me. I wasn't able to write or draw or dance or go on adventures or travel around. I was in a hospital bed. And I'm so grateful that I have such good friends because my identity that I found in those moments was I'm a person who is loved and who loves. And even though I couldn't produce anything and I didn't know if I would ever be able to finish my book, I had this beautiful um, social part of my life that became so much more important to me at that moment. So the thing that I had worked on cultivating in myself, writing and drawing, um, wasn't there for me, me anymore, but my friends were. So by spending a lot of time trying new things, getting to know different people, you really do cultivate an identity based in a number of different things, which is really important when you're <laughs> paralyzed and other disasters. Um, a lot of the jobs that I had in my 20s seemed completely meaningless at the time. Some were more meaningful than others, but I mean, a small sampling. I taught English as a second language. I taught tap dancing. I was a men's fashion writer. I was a barista for 950 years. I put in so much effort to learn from each of these experiences because I didn't really find that much meaning in any one of them. And so I had to make it fun for myself. It kind of felt like my life wasn't really adding up and I was just sort of at these random jobs. And so I had to make them fun. For example, I worked at a bakery when I was 23. And I had to take two trains in the morning to get there. I had to open at like five. So I got up at like 3.30, took the trains. Like in Chicago, it's freezing all the time. I hated it, and I made like less than minimum wage. And um, the worst part of the morning was writing down every single thing that this bakery offered. I don't know why we didn't get like a chalkboard or a sign, but I had to write them every day on these tags. And I hated my handwriting. I thought it was so boring. And so I had to create a fun handwriting to make this more enjoyable for myself because I was pretty much stuck there for a while. And um, so that handwriting developed into the handwriting that I use now in my job. It's come in very handy. And that would not have happened if I hadn't worked at that bakery. So making these jobs meaningful for myself was a really great lesson in just making life more meaningful for myself and making the parts of life that seemed kind of dull and boring uh, fun and interesting. That came in handy in 2015. Pause for drama. Um, I had sort of a triple axel of tragedies. I lost my father at the same time as I was going through a traumatic breakup. Um, I had some health issues that kept me at home for a few weeks. And I feel like I pretty much hit rock bottom at that moment. It wasn't just about the loss, so much loss in my life. But it was also me at 27 looking around at my life and thinking, this isn't what I wanted. <laughs> Where do I take this back? I haven't done anything that I really wanted to do yet. I call myself a writer, but I don't really have anything published. Why haven't I written a book yet? Why haven't I done the things that I wanted to do? And I think the beauty of hitting a rock bottom place is you begin to realize life is totally within your control. You have to get yourself back up and you are the only person who can do that. And so in getting myself, working my way out of depression and grief, 
I also worked my way into a life that I really wanted. I started writing a book and I decided to be the person I wanted to be. I thought like, I wish I were the kind of person who took Portuguese lessons and started every day listening to Bossa Nova. I wish I were the kind of person who took photos and went to yoga. And I realized that is 100% within my control. And so I became that person I wanted to be. I wrote down about 50 things that I wanted to try and do consistently. And one of them was watercolor painting. It always made me really happy and I wanted to do it. So I started an Instagram account to keep myself accountable, um, kept it private for a month. And, um, and it was just a way that I could sort of record little things that happened to me during the day things that made me happy, and, um, and it was a way that I could relax. It's still the most relaxing part of my day. Um, so I think the power of, not, of getting to a place where you don't really have what you want is creating the things that you want. Um, so I began really investing in illustration as a hobby, and I realized the things that I thought were wrong with me were actually the things that gave me the power to connect to other people. Feeling left out most of my life, not fitting in, um, a really scattered resume, and experiencing loneliness and pain. Even feeling too old, I was 28 when I started, um, but when you start a hobby later in life, you have the most experience. So I had all this stuff, I had like eight years of stuff to talk about. Um, so I really saw that as a gift as I started um, doing it every day and running out of things that were happening to me. Now I can tap into stuff that, stuff that happened five years ago. Um, so if there's one message that I can get across from my Instagram account, people ask me this all the time, like what's the one message you're trying to send to other people? It's you can do this too. <laughs> this is not, there's no separation between me and the viewer. I'm not a good artist. Like I, I just draw my feelings. Um, but I think that anyone can make themselves happy with a new hobby. And I will give you um, some tips on some things that some powers that you might possess that you don't even really know about. Um, the first one is pain. We've all experienced different levels of pain in our lives. And pain can feel very useless. Um, I don't believe everything happens for a reason, but I do believe that there are things that we can cultivate from places of great pain. I think that the biggest gift of pain is empathy. Um, again, I'm not like the most technically gifted artist, but I have been through some stuff. And I think that that makes me able to talk about a lot of things that resonate with a lot of people, and I'm grateful for that. Um, sharing your story can be such a helpful gift for someone going through pain. When I was um, in the hospital last year, not only was I paralyzed, but I was, um, I could feel everything. So, uh, and extreme nerve damage causes extreme pain. I felt like there was an iron rod hitting my back at all times for about three weeks. And um, it was a profoundly lonely experience for me. It was a foreign country. I missed my friends. Um, I missed my mom until she was able to come. I didn't know what was happen happening to me. I was extremely scared. And I had a whole team of doctors working on me. And I don't know why they needed like six, but they sent in everyone they could get in Granada, Spain. <laughs> it was very flattering. Um, but the head doctor was like this young, strapping med student who looked like, like Spanish Josh Groban. And he diagnosed me right away, which was very fortunate because it's, it's hard to diagnose disease. And he knew every painkiller to give me. He knew all the technical, um, the technical ways to make me feel better. But the doctor I really loved was the one who had like, like tenure for doctors. Like he, he was like half blind. He was so old, like he'd been doing it forever. Um, 
but he was the one I really clung to, even though he didn't always know what kind of medicine to give me because he had been through life. And he had even been sick in a foreign country before, and he shared that with me. And that made me feel like I could get through it. And so, like, sometimes I don't feel like I'm the best friend. Um, you know, I wish I could afford to give my friends gifts and take them out to dinner. I wish that I could remember things better, like birthdays. But I know that I've experienced pain. And the fact that I can, you know, tell my own story, I know can heal others because that's been the case for me with my friends. Um, but I feel like when people told me, like, <laughs> you'll become a more empathetic person for going through pain, I was like, I would have rather just, like, been drinking sangria and dancing in Spain. Like, I didn't really need to get empathetic. Someone else can do that. Um, so I'll tell you how pain benefits you. Um, the capacity for joy that you are able to embody when you've experienced tremendous pain is out of control. Um, the appreciation for life that you develop, the creativity that you're able to cultivate, and just the daily appreciation of being alive is really something else. Um, I really believe that when you meet someone who is truly joyful, not just happy on Instagram, but truly joyful and appreciative, um, I can almost guarantee that person has been to hell and has done a lot of work to get out of it and can now share their stories with others and walk with others. I think that pain is one of the greatest gifts that uh, we are given. And if you haven't experienced it, don't worry, you will. <laughs> um, there are times of life, many times of life, when I think that we feel completely lonely and betrayed and like down on our luck, but there will be a time if you really do the work, if you do the mental health work, and you really work to find happiness again, you will find it times 100,000. And people will see that in you. Um, another gift is shame. You know like when you trip and fall in public, and then you like look around to see if anyone saw it, and then you like meet someone's eyes, and you're able to share this really beautiful laugh with a stranger. That's what shame can do. Life is really embarrassing. <laughs> it's embarrassing to be working a job you're not crazy about. It's embarrassing to get rejected from a job you wanted. It's embarrassing to break up. It's embarrassing to be left for someone else. I can tell you a thousand stories <laughs> about this. But there's so many times in life when you feel so ashamed just to like, be yourself. And the thing is, what you're usually experiencing is this glorious moment of isolation where there's something that happened to you that it feels unusual, but you can connect so powerfully with someone else. And especially when you speak your shame, like Brene Brown says to do. Um, <laughs> yes, that is... <laughs> That's, the, that's when you get rid of it. You get rid of your shame, and you begin a connection with someone. Um, the next one is uncertainty. Again, I think this is really hard for millennials to deal with. Um, we're supposed to have that straight arrow path, but I know so very few people who have that. Um, I think that all my best creative material, my best memories, my best photos, and all of these superpowers that I've developed in order to write a book and do the things I want to do came out of a place of not knowing what I wanted to do. Um, the best memory of my 20s was not getting a book deal. It was not quitting my job to be a writer. It was walking into the kitchen of the restaurant where I worked and asking the Irish chef, Connor, do you have a girlfriend? Can I kiss you? <laughs> that was it. And if I had any clue what the hell I was doing, that would have never, ever happened. These moments that are like burned in my memory as like my becoming 
and my source of joy and my source of laughter are the things that happened when I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I also, like, even if you're just kind of on like a nine to five path, um, my last job in marketing, um, I got because my boss looked at my resume and he said, wow, it looks like you have a fun resume. Meaning like, what have you been doing? But he knew that I could talk to different kinds of people. He knew that I, had so much experience with different demographics that I was able to actually write to them. Incredible. I didn't get a marketing degree. I just taught tap dance and was a waitress. And that was a lot of training for me. Um, the final one is being misunderstood. I think we all feel really misunderstood at certain times of our lives. And that can come in work, it can come in a relationship. People don't get me, I'm different from everyone else, I'm too much for people, I'm too complex for people, I don't fit in. That's a superpower. That means there's something special about you. And, that's, and the special thing about you is the thing that you have to share with the world. Um, I will paraphrase a quote I read one time in Real Simple. <laughs> um, the world doesn't need more water. When you are out at a restaurant with your friends and the waiter brings water, no one's excited about it. <laughs> no one hates it either. They're like, fine. If the waiter brings coffee, you might be like, oh, coffee, great. But no one's like throwing a party about it, nor is anyone like throwing it in the waiter's face. When someone orders straight whiskey, which is one of my favorite drinks, it's a little more controversial. A lot of people hate it, but a lot of people love it. And they get so into it, and they're so loyal to it that they'll like travel to Ireland or Scotland, and they'll go to that whiskey bar in Tribeca, and they will, like, you will never hear the end of how much they love whiskey. You want to be the whiskey. We have enough water. We have enough coffee. We have enough Instagram accounts about coffee. Make the hard art. Do the hard thing. Don't be easy. Don't be easy for the person you're dating. Don't be easy for your coworkers. Don't be easy on Instagram. Most of what I post on Instagram is not super easy for me to share. There's a lot of stuff I could share, and I know that it'll get likes. You know, I could say, like, gotta have my Java or whatever, and uh, that'll appeal to a lot of people. But is that doing anything for anyone? I don't think so. So when you are the potent version of yourself, and you are really flavorful and you are really strong, you will be rejected. People won't like you. A lot of people won't get you. I have an inbox folder with over 50 rejections because people didn't get me. They said, who are you like? What are you doing? What is this? What is this book idea? Um, the ones that you, know, you have to like say, what your book is similar to, and I, I named a couple books that I thought my book was kind of like would be shelved next to, and they were like, no, your book is not like that at all. <laughs> People don't care who you are, they aren't gonna read your story. But I didn't take no for an answer because I knew I had to tell this story, and it goes back to empathy. I knew that the art that I consumed during the hardest parts of my life saved me. And if I could do that for anyone else, that would be the greatest triumph of my life and the purpose for my life. So don't make things easy on other people. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. We don't need it. Um, I'm going to close with the last paragraph of my book, which is now available <laughs> wherever books are sold. <laughs> <laughs> <I've> <laughs> I never read this out loud. It's very weird. <laughs> you may not always have the same friends or same relationship you have now, but you'll always be with you. As a new adult, now is the time to become the person you want to live with for the rest of your life. 
One warm evening in Lisbon, at the height of my heartbreak, I was walking around feeling very lonely and envious of the beautiful and life-loving free spirits near me. They were playing guitar, drawing, dancing salsa, and crocheting around trees with neon yarn. I didn't really have anything to contribute to the scene except to sit there with my water bottle and write in my journal. They couldn't have felt farther away from my reality. It occurred to me that I could build a bridge to that reality. I could actually make myself into a person who plays guitar on a warm evening in a park. It would begin with guitar lessons. I signed up for as many classes as I had time to make for myself into the adventurous I wanted to be. I began to create my adult self. I decided I wanted to be a person who painted with watercolors for fun because it seemed like a really soothing activity. So I decided to make one illustration a day and color it in with cheap, a, pa a cheap paint set I had left over from babysitting. I'd made myself an artist simply by making art. The great gift of heartbreak, rejection, loss, any challenge, is that it's the impetus to stop hoping you'll be happy someday and start making yourself happy now. Making yourself into an adult is this ongoing process of transforming your life experience into the person you've chosen to be. Keep experiencing, keep challenge, challenging yourself, and keep having fun. Thank you. So we can take like four or so questions. Uh, if you want to raise your hand, would you like to call on people? And I will run oh, a microphone to them. On. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> does anyone have a question? Please raise your hand. Hi. Just want to say congratulations. The Thank book is amazing. You. And I want to know: Did the chef kiss you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> so when I found out that you were an only child, I lost my mind. I was like, oh my gosh, she, she gets me. Yes. This is incredible. And I know how, how happy it can be and also how challenging it can be. And I w was wondering how you kind of dealt with being an only child and how you went from like, I'm kind of lonely and I need to learn how to make friends into this outgoing extroverted person that you are. I loved being an only child. I loved it. Um, my parents were a little older when they had me, too. They were in their late 30s, late 40s. <laughs> and um, it was cool because they had already like lived this whole life. And then they had me, and they just kind of like threw me over their shoulder. And you know, we like I kind of did the things with them that they were going to do anyway, like travel and go out to dinner and stuff. So I feel like I had this really cool window into the adult world. And the blessing of that is that I knew that it would get better. <laughs> like I hated being in high school. I don't have any memories from high school because it was, I blocked it out of my memory. Like nothing good happened to me in high school. But I always knew it was going to get better. I was like, as soon as I get to college, life's going to be amazing. And it was, it was like I knew it because I knew that the adult world is awesome and you can like be whoever you want to be and you can dress the way you want to dress and like no one's going to like throw you in a locker or whatever. So um, yeah, I think it was great having that big world perspective. And you can still have that if you have siblings. It's not like an only child's like <laughs> belongs to us only, but it was for me a really good experience. And yeah, I just knew that life was going to get better, and I was never afraid to be myself because of that. Because I had a lot of adults being like, you can do this, it's fine. High school is very short. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you. Your talk was amazing. Um, I I think for so many people here, you're sort of the art that you know connects us and speaks to us, um, and we finally feel like, oh my gosh, someone gets it. What was some of the art or you know the things that you read or were inspired by that sort of did that for you? 
Gosh, I have so many, I have so many. I mean, it's so hard to see myself that way because I've, that's how I consume art. It's, um, it's really, really personal for me. A lot of music starting very young. Um, <laughs> I really liked um, Lupe Fiasco. <laughs> <laughs> And I remember feeling like he, he gets, like, we have something. Um, I'm really inspired by the illustrator Myra Kalman, who um, really gave me the space to do what I do. If you haven't read her, she's really, really lovely. Just her, uh, she just embraces all the good and bad of life. Um, Roz Chast, same, Alison Bechtel. Um, but... Yeah, there's so I would love to. I'm gonna do a post about this at some point. Like every artist who's given me that space. Um, when I lost my dad, Sufjan Stevens was a really big part of my grief journey. Um, he lost um, his mom, who was estranged. My dad and I were estranged, and I hadn't heard a story like that. And it really did give me the ability to understand my own feelings, which were very complicated and intense. And I felt like, I remember thinking, thank God, like, I know probably a lot of people told him or criticized him that his album was, like, so self-indulgent. But to me, it really was, like, it saved me. And I, I really wanted to give that feeling to other people once I had a perspective on it. Uh, thank you so much for coming today. This has been an amazing talk, and congrats on your book. Thank you. Um, I really liked hearing how you speak about empathy and like going through pain, heartbreak, all of that. I guess, personally for me, like going through that stuff, it's always easy to tell yourself to be strong and that there is like a better thing mm -hmm. ahead. You just have to like, stay happy, positive, but obviously there are low days and days that you feel like you're just saying that to yourself yeah. how do you think you really approach those days and like how do you keep going forward without having so many I guess yeah that's a great question I don't have the perspective until I've lived it you know so I'm speaking from someone who's a couple years removed but you know I'm going through stuff now I'm constantly going through stuff and it's, I think that it's tempting to really romanticize pain and think, and it, you know, when I was going through those really hard times, people would tell me, you're so strong, or like, when you get out of this, life's gonna be amazing, and that wasn't really helpful for me. It was helpful for me when people really came down to where I was and said, like, you are like really in it right now, and I'm here with you. You know, I'm here in these moments. Um, I don't think that it's helpful to like focus on the positive or choose happiness. I like to embrace the hard stuff. And for me, my joy is so closely linked to my pain. And um, when I'm in my most joyous moments, it's with all of the pain that I'm still experiencing. So. It's really hard to have perspective. Something that's always been helpful for me is journaling and um, imagining myself out of the pain. What am I gonna look like? What am I gonna feel like? I remember when I was in the hospital, um, that was April, and I asked like, when am I gonna be able to dance again? When am I gonna be able to like walk again, run again, whatever, yoga? They said, oh, probably like September. And it just felt like so long to me. Like, I can't wait till September. But I drew like a big red heart on September 1st. And I thought about who am I gonna be at that point? I'm gonna be someone who's so grateful, who like might not be able to be, you know, as strong or skilled as I once was, but I will be so grateful that I can do that. So I think imagining yourself past the pain is really powerful as well. Hi, Mari. Um, first, I guess I just have a couple things. Um, first, your shoes are amazing. Oh my gosh, I swear they I have other shoes. Great. I wear no, they these all so the time. <laughs> um, second, you sound like a social worker. So go social work. I know. Cool. We're um, a generation full of social justice and just yeah. getting really into mental health and your feelings. And I think. You're really promoting that, which is beautiful. 
Um, and then third thing, I also did the move from D.C. to New York recently, and I oh, really connected fun. with you through that. I think we did it around the same time, cool. too, which was crazy. But how did you manage to get to travel to so many places, and what was your first big adventure, and how did you navigate that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, travel is a big priority for me. I realize I'm in a very privileged position to get to do it. I also worked really hard to be able to do it. Um, for my first trip, I went on my first solo trip to Guatemala when I was 20, and I worked three jobs, con like overlapping jobs, to get to pay for it. It was just the thing that I really prioritized. Um, I love doing it, and I. I think that everyone has something that they love so much that they'll really sacrifice to be able to do it, and that's it for me. Um, so going to Guatemala when I was in college was so special because I think they weren't used to seeing someone so young um, come without like a school group or something. I was just like there, and I met a lot of people in their 30s who were there for like you know like finding themselves and it was really cool because I made a lot of intergenerational relationships that are still really precious to me and I was able to kind of see like the older version of myself and that was a really really beautiful trip I want to um the gift I want to give myself for doing this is going back to Guatemala for the first time and just kind of revisiting my old self. It was a really, really cool trip to me. And then um, right after college, I moved to South America for a year, which a lot of people were saying like, oh, that's so brave. And I was like, you're brave for taking an office job. I wouldn't know how to do that. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just something that I've always really valued, and I'm very lucky I've gotten to do it. More question, um, does anyone in the very far back and standing room have a question? So I do a shout out to someone. Did anyone have a question back there? Yeah, of course. Hi, Mari. Um, so I recently went through an injury as well at the same time as you. And I just wanted to ask how you recovered after you recovered, because I think that's a real process, and I'm still going through it as well. So I was just wondering how that process was for you. Thank you. Such a beautiful question. It's been really hard. It's been really hard. Um, I continue to struggle with uh, post-trauma, and I don't know if I'll ever be over it. And that's something that I've actually found very comforting because it was such a huge moment in my life. It almost feels like a disservice to myself to say, oh, I'll, I'll be over it and, you know, I'm fine. It's like it doesn't affect me anymore. It affects me every day. Um, I'm still recovering physically, but I think that I will always be recovering mentally and it's it's not something a lot of people understand so it's not something I talk about much um, I'd like to write more about it as I get a little more perspective but it was um, I've had I've had bouts of depression before but I don't know if I've experienced depression on that scale before the months afterwards it just felt like the, a kind of isolation I had never experienced before. And I think the hardest part is just knowing that a lot of people are in that space forever. And uh, that kind of empathy is really hard to take on for a, a really sensitive person. Um, but I get a lot of mental help. And um, I don't know if I'm ready to like be in a support group, but I think that that would be really helpful for a lot of people and um, continuing to think about it and process it um, and not you know, hide it under the covers of my mind is certainly important. Um, thank you so much. Um, please, another round of applause for Mari.